Okay, everyone. What's up? Gold here. And I'm going to be going over the 10-game main slate we have here on Tuesday, May 9. A um, couple more games here tonight, eh, but I think fewer arms that we could target. Um, some interesting spots. We've got uh, some projections and, and ownership are loaded to the site. Some noise coming in so far here. Um, some of the models are, are doing some goofy stuff with like Shohei, uh, as is kind of typical. Whenever he's on the mound, uh, you get some spillover for whether he's going to be a hitter or something. Um, we still haven't quite figured out how to automate all of this stuff. Uh, in our models when he is on the mound. So a little bit of noise here. Um, I think we're probably coming about in line at the moment to where he's likely to end up. We're going to see on a couple of these cheaper arms, um, relative to him at least, Logan Webb, George Kirby. You're going to see most of the ownership kind of filter to them, as we quite often do. Like 11-6, kind of hard to get to against a, a pretty okay offense. It's getting healthier over in Houston. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the game. So, um, same sort of distribution as we saw yesterday. Not a lot of arms down here in this uh, middling range that we're too thrilled about. Um, one down here, Clark Schmidt, we'll get to this probably in, I believe, our first game. Yeah. Um, garnering heavy, heavy ownership. Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Outside of that, everybody in the mid-range is kind of getting ignored and seeing most of the ownership spread out up top, which is generally how we how we want to approach things um, in a vacuum, right? We just want to get to the better arms that have tournament upside and, and all that kind of jazz. So that said, uh, keep an eye out for projection updates and, and uh, ownership pushes throughout the day as things will absolutely change so let's uh let's just get into it and we'll start off with oakland and new york um kind of a frustrating game here last night that the yankees ended up being very chalky and they ended up getting there um it's frustrating if you played or if you didn't play them right if you faded all of that and they ended up getting there because uh well jp sears was left in the game a little bit too long um I think they're probably going to see a good bit of ownership of the Yankees here again tonight. Drew Rosinski, well, unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to hop off the train. Um, man, he just hasn't he hasn't shown any of the same type of whiff stuff that he showed over in the KBO. Um, and we talked about that a little bit, that he had been on the best team in the KBO, so he was overall seeing weaker lineups in a vacuum. And it probably inflated his numbers just a little bit. And, um, you know, despite cheap price tags for him coming over, he's still getting picked apart pretty good. In his first couple of starts, he gave up, what, 11 hits against the Reds. Um, just three runs there, but, I mean, 11 hits, 11 hits. Did last five and, a two, five and two-thirds, but only struck out one guy. And then in his last outing against... Seattle, he walked five batters, right? Only lasted three and two-thirds. Um, struck out a couple more guys, but, like, whatever. You're giving up five runs and walking five guys. It doesn't really matter. So I think we're going to have to hop off the, the, the train here against the Yankees because they're probably getting judged back tonight, and they're starting to get a little bit healthier, right? They have Bader. Um, they have uh, signed and brought up Jake Bowers, right? Um Still missing Stanton and Donaldson, of course, but they're a little bit more solidified at the top of the lineup. And Judge, of course, makes this this lineup. I mean, it makes it kind of go from uh, attackable with like marginal arms, you know, not necessarily a JP Sears, but some you know, lower upside right-handed arms uh, to totally unattackable with. With all but the highest strikeout upside guys, uh, and Rosinski really in back over here in the bigs is not going to qualify uh, with Judge back in the two. So um, good spot once again for the Yankees. Uh, Volpe kind of shit the bed last night. 
with a flat zero. He's still at 42. Judge at 62. Going to make it a little bit more expensive to get to a full stack here. But Rosinski very likely going to be pitching to a good bit of contact still. Um, he could bounce, of course, uh, in terms of raw results. But we're paying a little bit more um, or a little bit higher of a price tag here rather or as opposed to when he came over, right, or or started, I, I suppose, in his first couple outings, 4,000 4, flat against Cincinnati, 5,000 in his last outing against Seattle. So he's up to 52, and the results have been dreadful. So, I mean, I'm not super interested in it. I don't think the raw strikeout upside is going to be there for him in this particular matchup. Um, Glaber, DJ, both seeing the baseball a little bit better, and as I mentioned, they got Bader back, who is a, a big upside bat for them in the middle. So, um, you know, they're, they're getting a little bit healthier here and probably less attackable, um, are the Yankees than they've been in the, in the last couple of months. So no Rosinski on the mound, just getting to Yankee stacks. Just have to be mindful of their ownership. Probably a, a top five, uh, popular stack today. Clark Schmidt on the mound, uh, alluded to this. Well, t I mean, this ownership is at 27% is probably I mean, it, it's almost definitely way too high. 6000 is an intriguing price tag. And what Schmidt has done is he developed a cutter in the offseason. I, I say developed. He just wasn't really here at all. So he's moved all of this four-seamer usage, uh, full 10% of the arsenal, over to the cutter. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately for him, it's not yielding any value whatsoever. So the, the usage number here... For the cutter at 8%, um, this is relative to the aggregate sample of 87 innings when he wasn't throwing this pitch last year. However, the value number here is accurate. He is losing, at a full 20% usage, five outs to the field here. And this is a bad, bad pitch at the moment. And so his slider value that he would you'd normally expect to spill over a little bit to a cutter when you add in this pitch, which is what he was expecting, right, when he when he added it. Um, it's actually, the cutter has been so bad that it's dragging down the slider value as well. And that's making it really difficult uh, for him to get out left-handed hitters. He's, he's still not got any swing and miss, not throwing a changeup or anything. The curveball is... Um, it is really his only positive expectation pitch here, but the the value is down a little bit. So the slider has now become more of a, a break even with extreme negative value on the cutter. The sinker is basically the same. Um, so he's getting hit very hard in the fastball categories, and he, he's not able to get out lefties at all. So I think this ownership is way too high at 27%, even though the, the price tag may be attractive, the arsenal is not whatsoever. So uh, he's on the barrel here and, and getting hit very hard by left-handed hitters. 35% hard contact, no soft contact induced whatsoever. 244 ISO and a full 2-0 homers per nine. And these numbers are persisting, and he's a Yankee Stadium. Uh, we don't want to be playing righties with lefty problems at Yankee Stadium. So I would much rather get to some short Oakland stacks here, like a Ryan Noda or uh, a J.J. Bladé. He's cheap. His price has come up a little bit to 27 now, but he's still going to be in the middle of the lineup. Um, maybe a Tony Kemp sort of stack filler, a little, little short stack filler at 2,800. It's not the greatest. Uh, but it's okay if you need it. Jace Peterson down at the bottom, 2,900, probably a little elevated in that scenario. But, um, you know, I, I do think a, a Ryan Noter or a J.J. Bladé here has a good bit of upside to take apart some Clark Schmidt problems uh, to the left side of the plate. And that's how I would mostly want to attack. Um, we still have got some a little bit higher upside uh, contact bats like an Asteri Ruiz at the top of the lineup. He's been great. He's much better against lefties, of course, but Brent Rooker's got power to both sides you can play. Shailene Lears behind the plate has power to both sides as well. So um, a little bit suspect here, and I think this ownership is a little bit too high. I'm going to be almost exclusively staying off of this 
Um, I think this projection is has gotten kind of out of control. The the slider value and the cutter value are just too extremely negative here at the moment. Um, still getting whiffs against the right side, yeah, but the lack of a like there's no changeup usage whatsoever, and there's no four seamer usage here either. So we still throw in the sinker mostly, and you know that's an okay pitch to uh, limit some damage a lot of the time to same handed hitters. But he's still going to be a little bit vulnerable there in terms of hard contact when he floats it. So north of 34 percent to both sides of the plate is not interesting to me at all. And it's mostly this huge ownership figure. I think this is way too high. So I'm going to be staying off of that. Not going out of my way to target Oakland necessarily, but or to play Oakland necessarily. Uh, but I, I do think a Ryan Nota, J.J. Bladey type of plays are are very viable. Okay, Boston and Atlanta. Uh, Nick Pavetta on the mound for the Red Sox. Charlie Morton for the Braves. Uh, I think we're going to be able to get to some offense here. I did. I like this spot a lot. Um, now we're not. We'll probably see some ownership on Atlanta. And it's because Nick Pavetta is still giving up a boatload of power to both sides. He's walking lefties still, giving up a lot of power to them. And he's giving up a hell of a lot of hard contact to the right side still. So as far as the arsenal goes, um, the fastball is at about the same usage right now. But this is a, a variant pitch because in the last, you know, whatever, 128 and two-thirds against right-handers, um, and 211 innings in aggregate, it's it's neutral value for him. So you're often going to see when it's not right, mechanics are off a little bit, release points off a little bit, whatever, you're going to see a lot of variance in this value, right? So um, in the early going this year, 40 innings or, or whatever, um, this value is down to losing about three quarters of an out per hundred. So um, losing a lot of the, the I, I suppose, neutral and break even survival value, if you will, uh, on this four seamer. Now that we, we've gotten into 2023 a little bit, um, cutter and splitter, they're you know not notable at all this Slider is, is is kind of morphed into a, a bit of a cutter. Um, it's still at the same usage, but uh, the value is is dropping a little bit. It's down to about a, a half an out or so uh, combined on on both the pitches. So this is really his only good pitch. Curveball is still really really bad, um, and he's throwing it a couple ticks higher at a full thirty percent now. So um, losing about a and out in a quarter to the field. So really discouraging for Pavetta overall. Uh, the the price tag may look a little intriguing here, but I think this is trappy, and I'm not going after Atlanta. Um, this is a very strong offense over here. I think this, this is a good spot for them to get after some Pavetta. Now, what's going to prevent us from getting outsized exposures to Atlanta is the pricing. Acuna 65, Olsen 57, Riley 55, Murphy 52, Albies 45. They're probably going to get Travis Darno back today. They haven't activated him, or maybe no, they did activate him yesterday. He didn't um, he? Didn't play though. I don't think. Uh, the, the Braves may not have even played yesterday. I don't know. I can't keep it straight. Too many baseball games. Anyway, 4600 for Darno. He's probably a little expensive. Um, as are the other guys though. So. I mean, price adjusted, the favorite play here has still got to be Eddie Rosario hitting in the five hole at 2,500. He's He's been overall underwhelming, but he makes the whole stack work, uh, as does Michael Harris at 3,800. So uh, you can mix in uh, a couple of these guys, like uh, Marcelo Suna if he's, if he's in there, Kevin Pillar, whatever. Um, the offense really starting to heat up, Sammy Hilliard, things like this. Um so they're a very playable stack if you can make it happen. Uh, I would like to get to some of the Braves today and target some Pavetta. Charlie Morton on the mound for Atlanta. 8,900. I'm not doing this. Uh, Boston is one of the best teams in baseball against right-handed pitching. And Charlie Morton still got severe problems to the left side. Nothing's really changed for Charlie. He's not going to make sweeping changes in the arsenal here. But what he has done is moved a little bit more usage over to the curveball. He's starting at a full 45% of the time now. 
and the fastball has still been really, really bad. The uh, four seamer down to about um, actually the the sinker is is up in usage uh, a, a tick, and that's mostly from the four seamer. It's come over from here, so the four seamer is down in usage a little bit, but it, it's staying within this um, within this sort of fastball arena, but. He's just trying to figure something out to survive here a little bit, and they're both just getting absolutely blasted. So major problems in the fastball category. Changeup still bad, um, and it, the the usage is is about the same. But he's still he's now losing about a, an out to the field, so about three times as as bad. So um, not encouraging there either. So bad fastballs, bad change. Curveball is still very equitable for him, and that's why he's throwing more of it. The value has about doubled on it, so that's great. But the price tag is still high on Charlie at 8,900. And th as I mentioned, Boston is fantastic against right-handed pitching. This season, 118 WRC+, 18.5% K rate with a 194 ISO. 31, 32% hard contact rate, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball. So they're going to get it in the air here. It's going to be on the barrel, and they're going to hit for some power. 352 Woba is very strong. So uh, I want to go after offense. No Charlie Morton on the mound. I think this price tag is is too high. Uh, and he's really only got one good pitch, and and it's the curveball, really as it it's always been. It's real good value, but losing a lot more value uh, as Charlie's getting up there in age, so uh, on every one of the other pitches, so really not encouraged there. And he's going to elevate the pitch count still with uh, a sub 60% strike one rate. He's going to get on the barrel and be very susceptible to to left-handers. I would much rather get to Boston here instead of Atlanta because their pricing makes it a little bit more palatable, and they're not going to be nearly as popular. So yeah, give me uh, give me the Red Sox and definitely give me the Braves if you can make it happen. Okay, Dodgers and the Brewers. Um, interesting tournament game here last night. Both arms were good, and, and it turns out the Brewers ended up getting there mostly off of the Dodger bullpen. We also mentioned that they have been very susceptible. Um, but Gonsolin was uh, was very strong, as was Freddie on the mound. I don't think we're going to see the same type of production here on the mound, at least. 7400 for Syndergaard. It's an intriguing and okay price tag. Velocity has ticked up a little bit. Um, Usage-wise, fastball really no change, and the and the sinker is still at about you know 32, 35 percent, give or take. Uh, but the sinker here so far, it, he's seeing a huge, huge value loss, about two and a half outs from this number. Now that he's giving up to the field at about you know half an out per. So. Um, very worrisome here in the two seamer. Four seamer has really never been good, and the you know the value still bad, and and the usage is still at about 15%. So now that he's he's got no value coming out of the fastball arsenal, um, it like no thank you. A lot of the real change here has moved over to a cutter, but it's a it's a you know similar to. Um, to like a, a Clark Schmidt, it's a, a slider cutter kind of hybrid pitch, similar to a a Pavetta kind of a hybrid pitch here that's just getting categorized. Uh, about 22% of the arsenal, um, they're really not seeing value there either. In aggregate, these numbers are about the same, giving up about a half an out per hundred on uh, on those two pitches. So overall, we're painting a pretty bad picture here. Bad sliders. Uh, or excuse me, bad fastballs with a bad slider now. Changeup is up to 27% or so in in usage, but the value is still way down here, giving up two outs to the field. So uh, the curveball, he's, he's about half the usage, um, and he's increased the value here, but unfortunately, you know, a good pitch that you don't throw very often, is, is that really a good pitch? I mean, I don't know. So... 
I'm not too wild about going after Syndergaard here. No matter how you slice the arsenal, the, the raw strikeout stuff for DFS just isn't there. Uh, 16.5% aggregate K rate, that hasn't really changed, and it's not certainly not going to go up uh, if he's not getting any value out, out of the fastball arsenal whatsoever. So uh, I think we get to some brewers here, as we've talked about the last couple of days. They're still hitting the baseball hard. They've been overall pretty disappointing against right-handers this year. I say disappointing, but they've been average. Still walking a lot. This number's come down from the 13% that we saw you know, a week or two ago. 104 WRC plus and average in most every metric. Kind of worrisome buck 40 ground ball to fly ball here. Um, so they're going to hit the baseball on the ground, which makes them kind of frustrating. But I think we can go after some cinder guard here with a very suspect change in value. In the in the sinker in particular, so um, you know that's generally not a good pitch to the left side of the plate, and when it's bad, it's going to get real bad, and the changeup will commensurately be bad as well. So uh, really, no way for him to survive here anymore um, outside of a five percent usage curveball. But like, what are we going to do with that? So give me the Brewers here uh, against Syndergaard, like offense from them for sure. Uh, price wise. They are a little bit more playable. A couple guys are expensive. Yelich, sure, 52, but he's fine at leading off. Uh, Willie at 53 is still expensive. 46 for Rowdy is okay, and 45 for Willie Contreras behind the plate is okay. So, But plenty of guys down at the bottom that can make it cheaper for you. Uh, Eric Lauer on the mound for the Brewers. I'm also not playing him against the Dodgers. 7,800. Uh, I don't really want to be going after this price tag necessarily. And he's still giving up power. Um, no change, really, in the four-seamer value uh, or the usage. So that that's pretty static here. Um, Cutter is up to about 32%. So he's, he's moved some usage over to a raw cutter, but it, still seeing a you know, pretty negative value at giving up about an out per 100 to the field. Uh, not throwing the change really at all anymore. It's just about 1% now. So that's all that usage has gone to the cutter. And the slider, we're getting into this sort of categorization nonsense, uh, down to about 10%, but um, you know, hybrid with the cutter. And value is basically hovering at about break even here too. So decreasing value overall in the arsenal. Curveball still bad in and, and there's no change in the usage, really. The but the value, I mean, it's about three times as bad. So, um, you know, we're we're going the wrong direction here for Eric Lauer, and I don't want to deal with that against the Dodgers. I'd like to get to them a little bit, and they're probably going to be one of the more popular stacks today, also because pa uh, Lauer gives up power. Um, going back to last season, big problems to the right side. 200 ISO, 24% K rate, yeah, whatever, but a 37% hard contact rate and a 1.7 homers per nine. So give me the Dodgers here, definitely. I think we can get to all of the righties pretty confidently. You can play Freddie, of course. He's down to 48 now. You can play him against lefties, no problem. Um, Max Muncie, I'm less enthused about in general because his split isn't great against lefties, but just a 21% K rate for... Lauer against lefties as it is, and as I mentioned, get, not getting a lot of value out of the slider and the cutter combo here. So that's really going to depress a lot of the upside that he would otherwise see against lefties. So Muncie is playable, uh, as is an, an outman. He's going to strike out a lot, just in general as a young hitter, but you can get to a lot of the Dodgers. Mookie, of course. Uh, Chris Taylor probably be in the middle of the lineup again. Miguel Vargas been great, and Will Smith, who got a day off yesterday, is at a playable 5,100. So I think we, uh, we're going to want to target some offense here in this game and probably nothing on the mound, and we're probably going to be saying that a lot. Okay, San Diego, Minnesota here. Uh, interesting game. Michael Walker, intriguing price tag, number one, at 6,600. Uh, but I really don't like anything that's going on with Michael Walker in the arsenal either. Um, now... We have seen this a couple of times, in particular with like John Gray yesterday, right, where you just see a a, a price dump about 1,200 cheaper than than guys have been previously, and and they bounce pretty hard. And uh, we could very well see that today with Waka. However, his one good pitch in the changeup, we talk about this all the time. He's always had a pretty good change. Uh, he's he's losing a lot of value on it this season. Um, 
you know, it's it's been a pretty equitable pitch for him. In in general, he can go to it a lot of the time when the four seamer has been bad. He can still salvage a little bit of that value with the change. Throw it right on right too a little bit. But uh, this year he's he's losing outs to the field. Uh, so that sort of dynamic and being able to rely a bit more on the change and establish with it when he can't quite find fastball command, uh, he can't go to that anymore. So that makes him a lot more susceptible. And we're kind of seeing that in the results. He's really had one good start this season, and that was against Atlanta where he struck out 10. And we talked immediately after that. We wanted to fade him uh, with the Brewers, and sure enough, he gave up seven earned in his very next start. So, um, And he hasn't been really good since then. Gave up five in his start after the Brewers to Arizona. Gave up another three against the Cubs. Strikeout stuff has dropped off the cliff. And really, he was fine in terms of uh, durability, I suppose. In his last start against Cincinnati, gave up just two hits, struck out three, but lasted six innings. So perhaps turning the quarter a little bit, and that's what makes me uh, a little intrigued by this price drop here. Um, He's been in the mid-7s and and low 8K, even mid-8Ks. Uh, all season, and now he's down to 8,600. So I think this is a playable price tag in general. And we can target the Twins a little bit because they've just been average too and very frustrating in some playable matchups. 96 WRC plus, 9% walk rate, which is kind of encouraging, but a 25% K rate because they they swing and miss off a of tee. This is really buoyed a lot by Gallo, who is terrible. But Buxton strikes out, and some of their younger hitters like uh, Trevor Larnick, who has since been optioned with the recent call. Uh, or activation of Alex Kirilov, you know, these guys, some of these guys will swing and miss too. So they're getting a little bit healthier. I'm not sure I want to go out of my way to target the Twins all that much anymore because they've got, as I mentioned, Kirilov and Georgie Polanco back healthy. Still going to strike out a little bit and still going to be overall pretty underwhelming sometimes in good matchups, but still uh, dangerous over here. And at playable price tags, if you want to get to them, Georgie, is 4,800 at second base, kind of stiff there, but Correa is 45, that's playable. Max Kepler still leading off against righties at 38, you can play that. And Buxton is fine, he has plenty of upside at 56, but he strikes out a lot. So um, Kirilov, 2,800, a hell of a lot of upside, first in outfield eligibility there. So you can make a stack work here with a lot of these different guys. If you want to target some of this uh, regression in, in the changeup value, everything else in the arsenal is basically the same. But bad fastball here, bad four-seamer that he's still throwing a lot, which you just, like, totally get rid of the pitch. But uh, he's not doing it. So um, it's re- it's really the the, the change-up susceptibility here that's going to make him a little bit more attackable from the left side. But he gives up power to both sides here, 182 ISO to lefties and 191 ISO to uh, to the right side with some hard contact. So we can go after him uh, with the Twins if you'd like. Eh, despite an intriguing price tag, I, I eh, I'm just kind of lukewarm on it. I'm not super interested in uh, either side necessarily, but if I had to choose, I guess it'd be the Twins. Uh, ugh, it's kind of gross. Uh, 6,800 for Louis Varland on the mound for Minnesota, and same sort of deal here. Uh, four seamer usage is is way down to about 34% here, um, and he's moved all of it, I believe. Uh, let's see. I'm looking over here on the other other monitor. Yeah, moved all of it over to the slider. So, um, down to 34, 35 percent here in the in the fastball, which is good. We generally don't want to rely on on one pitch too heavily, but we want to spread it out a little bit more. So he's, you know, a four seamer slider change guy is going to leave him at about a, a neutral ground ball to fly ball. Now he, he throws strikes and he throws it over the plate. Does pitch to a good bit of contact. Value-wise in the arsenal so far, um, really the slider has been a fantastic pitch. So it's good to see that he's moved so much of that usage over to something he's really feeling here in the slider. Given that he's still getting um, you know, some real negative value, I mean, it's a short sample. He's only thrown like 10 and 10 a third or 10 and two thirds or something this season. Um, so this will flatten out, but the, he's seeing extreme negative value on his on his four-seamer so far. 
an extreme positive value on the slider. So the, the values are going to flatten out a little bit, and they'll probably be mostly in line with this. I think the slider will be a little bit better. Change up is, you know, hovering around this sort of break even value as well. Um, so it, we just kind of got to wait and see for Louis. But uh, do we want to go after the Padres with a generally average strikeout arm? I would say no, right? Uh, certainly at an elevated price tag, 6,800. Uh, I'm not super intrigued by that. Padres been one of these disappointing teams, just a 93 WRC plus, but. Still, most of these ABs have come without Tatis, um, and and that's definitely going to change. Very high walk rate still, high K rate, not so much power, but this is going to turn around. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, Tatis has really been excellent since he came back, so uh, I don't really expect that to change much. You can play some of the Padres tonight if you'd like. Maybe some sneaky offense here, also some sneaky weather, so you got to keep an eye on that. But uh, overall, just kind of a mid game. Um, kind of a middling eight and a half and nine total, I believe. Uh, it's an intriguing tournament game because Waka could pop here, I think, a little bit. Louis Varlin has displayed strikeout upside in the high upside in the minors, but um, you know, and and the Padres have been striking out a little bit, so maybe Louis could squeeze out a little bit of little bit of value. But you could also play the offenses on either side because there's some susceptibility in the arsenals here. Um. So I'm not overly thrilled about going after this. I think it's a pretty highly variant game, but interesting for tournaments, I think, for sure. Okay, White Sox and the Royals. Uh, White Sox, again, only put up three runs against Grinky yesterday, and you know, sure enough, like he's just super frustrating to stack against, uh, especially with bad teams, and White Sox absolutely qualify as a bad team. Um, I think we're still going to be able to get some pieces here. I'm a little bit more excited, I, I suppose, uh, uh, to go after some Jordan Lyles here than Zach Granke, even though they're they're similar arms. Um, you know, Jordan Lyles, his, his fastball has actually been fantastic this year, and it's really allowing to, him to survive when everything else is bad. Um, but that's really the only thing that's allowed him to you know, survive at all, I suppose. 6,200. We talk about this for these some of these cheaper arms. There's upside for them to pop through this price. But Jordan Lyles, he's only hit 16 DK points like once or twice this season. And that like that's basically his ceiling. So still no raw strikeout stuff from from Lyles. And not a lot in the arsenal has changed uh, usage-wise. It's just some, some variance uh, in the actual realized values. So um, mostly just the same here for Lyles. So I think we can rely uh, pretty uh, pretty well on these numbers, I suppose, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, and and just kind of expect that there's going to be a lot of variance with, with Jordan Lyles. And uh, targeting a traditionally lower strikeout team like the White Sox, uh, I'm not super interested in it. Definitely not with a, a low strikeout pitcher. Um, I would like to get to, I think, a little bit of Tim Anderson and perhaps some Benintendi. I think he is an okay play today. Once again, to 3,600. Gavin Sheets hit a bomb yesterday, 25. He's a playable piece. Uh, Luis Robert, 46. This is okay as well. And Andrew Vaughn will round out a top five stack at 3,100 if you want to get there. I think that's probably, as as far as my interest goes, just the top five. The bottom of the lineup here is, is pretty poor. Um, so that's, that's really what takes me off of some outsized exposures of the White Sox, I think. I'm just not overly interested in, in the bottom half of the lineup where there are cheaper guys. So... Um, all of those White Sox stacks are basically going to be the same if if the field is doing the same thing as I am and playing just the top five guys because none of them have dual eligibility and you got to play all three outfielders. So <laughs> that's kind of unfortunate. Um, so it kind of pigeonholes you into some real chalky-ish builds relative to all the other White Sox teams. So I'm not super thrilled about that. If you want to get off the board with them, then you got to start playing Hanser Alberto, Elvis Andrew, Sebi Zavala types. Um, or Yasmani Grandal, who's, like, washed, you know. So I'm not super thrilled about going after the White Sox here. Outside of some Lucas Giolito on the mound, I think this is very playable now. And Giolito is actually 
made some changes here in terms of value. He's getting more value out of the four-seamer and more value out of the slider. Change-up still pretty susceptible. Um, but the four-seamer-slider combination, he's kind of righted the ship a little bit. And I think that's what's made him very serviceable. He was very good in his last start. I believe he was 7,400. He was. And he got uh, Minnesota. Uh, went seven innings, struck out seven. So the K stuff is starting to show up again for Giolito. And that's because he's been able to establish command with the fastball. He's he's throwing more strikes earlier in the count. We're seeing the first pitch strike rate tick up a little bit. And the K stuff is starting to uh, resurface. Certainly against the right side. And he is neutralizing power a little bit there. Uh, more Certainly more so than the last couple of seasons. It's the changeup that's where he's really been vulnerable this year. So if we're going to get to any... Um, of the Royals, I think we'd once again like to go after some of the lefties. Probably in this matchup, stay off of the righties even more so than yesterday. Again, Cease. Cease is just like totally washed. He's fully broken, I think. Um, we'll get to him in his next start. But Giolito is one of the few encouraging sort of bright lights here for the White Sox in their rotation. I think he's going in the right direction. Um, change up's still bad, but it's going to keep him as a more... Or, or flip him back, I suppose, to a more traditional type of platoon split with more susceptibility to the left side and less to same-handed hitter. So if you want to get to some lefties here, I think you can play MJ again, 41. I think that's fine. Uh, we can go right back to Vinny at 41 as well. Also fine, Nick Prado. We talked about this sort of lefty stack yesterday. thought that was very interesting, and they all went off. So uh, you can play him once again, first base and outfield eligibility at 2,600. Like I said, less enthused about getting to the righties as the slider value and four-seamer value uh, are, are spiking really hard to the upside right now for Giolito, feeling these two, and it's allowing him to neutralize a lot of that power. So not crazy about going after Salvi at back to 4,800 now, uh, or a Bobby Witt uh, at 52 still. So uh, probably just a short stack if I want to get off of some of the Giolito, but I really don't. I'd rather play him at 8,300. I think this is a very good spot targeting the Royals. Um, despite the fact that they've been okay in the last week or so, we had kind of expected that they weren't going to be that bad with a 65 WRC plus or whatever all season. So that's rebounded quite aggressively here in the last couple of weeks. I think it's about time that we, um, we realize that these guys are the Royals and we start taking some shorts back on them. Uh, 25% aggregate K rate, still not walking a lot, still not a lot of power, so if we're not getting to full stacks, it's kind of hard for the Royals to get there. Only a couple of guys that are going to be able to hit the ball over the wall, and I think Giolito is going to be able to neutralize that a little bit here. So I like this ownership here so far, 13%, and a high median projection. So everything looks good. I think this is one of the few arms in the mid-range that we can really get excited about. Uh, okay, St. Louis and Chicago. Uh, Jack Flaherty finally got blasted in his last start. Uh, we've been waiting for it, so I'm here to victory lap. Um, after <laughs> losing everything I own for the first five starts or whatever. Uh, 7,700 on the mound for Flaherty. I'm still not doing this. Um, it, now, despite the fact that I, I generally don't like going after guys after they give up a career worst in production, um, I still don't believe in Flaherty. Like, the fastball here, four-seamer, still a lot of the usage is still terrible it, it's an awful awful pitch for him he still can't throw for a strike now he's he's starting to figure out the control a little bit more um but he's still seeing yielding about you know two two and a half outs to the field here uh in in negative value so that, no thank you i'm just not doing it with a guy that has a bad fastball even though the slider is good he's still throwing a lot of this curveball which is pretty bad still um and and the four seamer, like I said, it, it he can't establish early in counts. So while he has migrated a little bit of usage over to this sort of slider cutter hybrid, um, the the sinker is, is basically gone. So there's no value that he could salvage there with the fastball. Um, good cutter, good slider, but you you can't throw one pitch even if it's a fastball or a slider. 50 some odd percent of the time or whatever uh, and really survive all that long unless you've got other stuff to to 
to attack with as well. And he just doesn't. Curveball's bad. Four-seamer's bad. Slider is good, which will neutralize some right-handed power over here. But he's still having trouble going deep into counts, uh, or going deep into games, rather, because he gets too deep into counts and elevates the pitch count. So, um, if anything, I'd, I'd rather go after the Cubs. It's a little warmer in Chicago tonight, about 60 degrees as opposed to 50. Uh, wind has calmed down. So, if you want to get to a couple of Cubs stacks, they're going to be totally off the board. They did lose Nico Horner, and unfortunately, uh, to like a hammy or something, um, he would have been hard to play because he's expensive, but he really makes the lineup tick. So that's really unfortunate. Uh, they have called up a couple other guys like uh, Miguel Amaya behind the plate or Matt Mervis at first base. Those are playable if they're in the list. Dansby down to 46, that's fine. Ian Happ, we like him against righties. 48, that's okay. It's kind of elevated. Say a Suzuki, 46, Belly at 43, et cetera, on down the line. Um, so you can get to a couple of Cub stacks. Probably some short stacks here, I think, would be most equitable. Um, not super interested, like I said, in attacking guys after they give up a career worst in production. But that's not to say I want to play Flaherty. I, I still don't like the arsenal. I still don't like the control. Um, and he's only got one good pitch, so I'm really not interested. Jameson Tyon on the mound for the Cubs. 7,500, also not super interested here. I don't want to go after the Cardinals' offense in general. And although Tyon later in his career, is, is he's toning down a lot of the garbage that he's throwing um, and, and starting to dial in the arsenal a little bit. Uh, let's see what he's doing over here. He's moved about 10% of the fastball usage over here to the cutter and really gotten a lot of value out of it. So that's encouraging. He's going in the right direction in that regard. But unfortunately, um, he's getting a lot of value out of the four-seamer, that is. Uh, unfortunately, in sacrificing 10% of his usage and moving it to the slider cutter, uh, the, the slider and the cutter, like, slider was basically break-even before, cutter was bad before, and now they're extreme negative value. He's getting torched here, giving up about... Uh, two and a half outs to the field. So very worrisome here that he's moving usage over to pitches where he's getting less value, unfortunately. Um, now he's, you know, neutralizing that a little bit with plus value on the four-seamer itself, you know, but not throwing it as often. So uh, you know, kind of a, a wash, I suppose. Um, the sinker's still here. Change up as about half the usage so he's moving away from the traditionally marginal and and negative value pitches and trying to get more toward the the plus value here in the in the curveball and the slider in particular but struggling a little bit with the change in the arsenal so um no matter he still gives up a little bit of pop 180 iso to both sides of the plate some hard contact north of 30 percent to both sides as well and in aggregate, just a 10% swing strike rate with a 21% K rate. So not overly thrilling, and still pitches to an 80% contact rate. And I'm not dealing with that uh, against the Cardinals here. I think you target some sneaky offense in this game because the arsenals for the starting pitchers are not all that attractive. 103 WRC plus for the Cards, 21% K rate themselves. We're going to start to see this tick up a little bit. Still a lot of hard contact, as we've talked about, 35% for the cards against righties this season. So you could target some tie on a little bit with some really off the board Cardinal stacks. Um, Arenado got a day off yesterday. I think he tweaked his neck or something like that. Um, price is still a little hard to get to here. So that's probably what's going to keep most of the field off. Uh, so it'll be off the board definitely, but I don't think it's like a, a super crazy tournament stack um, to consider really either side here, mostly short stacks, as I mentioned of the Cubs. Uh, and pretty much no pitching here, not overly interested. Okay, uh, Houston and the Angels. The Angels, man, they've been frustrating. <laughs> uh, offensively and in the pitching staff and all kinds of deal. They, they kind of got after my boy Hunter Brown yesterday. Um, he was spraying a little, spraying it a little bit, and this offense just kind of kind of hard to target. And we talked about this earlier in the season. They are likely to be a little bit better with the healthy Rendon in the middle of the lineup. Um, Hunter Renfro has been great hitting for a lot of power trout and Otani, of course, in the middle there as well. Taylor Ward's been moved back up to the top. He's still at 4,000 now that he kind of had his little lull where 
He was dreadful for about two weeks. Um, and some of the young guys, well, in particular, Zach Neto, like he's he's been fine and is turning the lineup over a little bit. So they're they're stabilizing here really against both sides and against lefties in particular they've been fantastic. Now Framber Valdez on the mound at 10-7 for the Strohs. He is not a typical lefty, right? Um he's got a monster ground ball rate, three and a half ground ball to fly ball to the left side and four and a half to the righties in aggregate about four and an average launch angle uh, that's negative. I'm, I think he's the only guy in, in baseball that has this. So um, we don't want to go after Framber. It's just so difficult to eke out any power against him. He has an 078 ISO to lefties and 091 ISO to the righties. Um, unfortunately for him, like the sinker, like that that's usually like that's his money pitch, right? It's what keeps him down in the strike zone and what allows him to really keep the ball on the ground. Uh, he's still throwing it at about 45% of the time, or 50% of the time, give or take. And unfortunately, though, the 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 value in, in the secondary stuff is really, you know, working off of the sinker is really where he's lacking in value. The slider's been traditionally very good, but not seeing any value out of that whatsoever, he's he's lost all of it. And he's giving up a quarter of an out to the field now um, in the slider. He's dropped the usage to about uh, 10% or so. Um, I guess that's uh, in aggregate where he's, he's really been. In the curveball, he's at, uh, what, 27% last season. And looking over here on the other monitor, he's still at about 25-26%. So the changeup is still um, has ticked up a little bit. And, you know, Basically, just early season noise and 45, 50 innings, whatever he's thrown. So, um, sinker's still valuable in, in keeping the baseball down, but the slider is really what has been a kind of the whiff pitch for him because the sinker's not the strikeout pitch. And unfortunately, he's he's lacking quite a bit. And the the changeup so far is also getting uh, get, getting blown up and hit pretty hard. So, um, some question marks here in the secondary arsenal which are going to take me off of the full 10-7 price tag here. And like I said, we don't want to go after the Angels. who's not going to strike out a lot uh, against lefties. They are going to hit some a lot of ground balls here, so I don't want to play them. They're expensive still. Uh, but you could maybe throw in like a super deep tournament stack of, uh, of the Angels, play Trout, uh, Hunter Renfro, maybe an Anthony Rendon, fly ball hitters uh, against, right, uh, against lefties. Um, Pretty off the board, though, and pretty low probability because even still with the negative value on the slider, he's not going to give up a lot of power, is for Amber. But that doesn't mean I want to play him at 10-7. I think he's probably a little bit overpriced given the negative value realized so far in the arsenal. Shohei on the mound for the Angels. Uh, everything's fine here. Um, nothing really to speak of. Still throwing a lot. Has come off of the splitter a little bit, not throwing this nearly as much, uh, and throwing the, the slider a, a full... 50% of the time now, nearly. Uh, fastball is still excellent, and the slider-cutter combo is still pretty good. Uh, not throwing as much of the curveball anymore, so migrating a little bit over to his good pitches, which is what we want to see. And uh, in the expensive range, this is kind of where I'd like to get to. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, the ownership we got to keep an eye on for Shohei uh, as it will flesh out in the next um, you know, several hours as the day moves along. 11-6 is really what's going to be the most difficult thing to make happen here. It's a full 10-gamer. We can find value. That's not usually an issue. And we'll get to uh, a cheap arm that uh, I think is going to allow us to unlock some 11-6 Shohei. So overall, still a lot of value on the four-seamer and a lot of value on the slider. Um, not throwing as much of the split, and it's kind of worrisome. I wish he keep this pitch but it's not like he's completely eliminated it uh he is he's still throwing it uh, about six percent of the time so not migrating a hell of a lot of usage over to it uh or to anything else and still just 39 innings that he's thrown so far this season so nothing has changed all too drastically here in the arsenal and it's still pretty good um still sinker at, at about five percent of the arsenal you know whatever so uh nothing Nothing alarming here for Shohei. 
Uh, and I think this is an okay spot to kind of go after some of the Astros um, with some high upside righties. 24% aggregate K rate. Now, we do have to keep an eye on uh, whether Michael Brantley is going to be activated. I believe Dusty said that uh, he's with the team in Atlanta, at or uh, in Anaheim at least, um, but not quite ready to get activated. So we'll keep an eye on that. They did activate Chaz McCormick yesterday, so starting to get healthy are the Astros over here. We're going to see this lineup start to round into form. However, uh, we're not going to go after Shohei. They're only hitting for a buck 16 ISO uh, against righties so far this season, and, I mean, I'm not super interested in, in attacking Shohei um, in any case. So if they are healthy with a Michael Brantley, it, it kind of takes me off of Shohei a little bit more just because Brantley is a very good hitter, and he's he doesn't strike out a lot. But that doesn't mean I want to play him. Um, Kyle Tucker and, and Brantley and Jordan Alvarez from the left side of the plate make the lineup a little bit more balanced. But overall, they're still pretty right-handed heavy, and Shohei still has a 30% K rate to the left side over his last 200 innings. So, or 100 innings uh, against lefties. So, um, I, I I like Shohei, and this is the guy I'd like to get to if I'm getting up above 10,000 today. Okay, let's move on to Texas and Seattle. Uh, Andrew Heaney on the mound. Yikes. A um, little bit more fastball value for him this season, and... He's taken about 10% of the usage of the slider, moved it over to the changeup, as a matter of fact. So slider, unfortunately, has been horrible, um, yielding a lot of real negative value for him. And, the, and that has commensurately dropped the strikeout rate from the aggregate 32 33% that we saw over the last season. Plus, it's now down to about 25% this year. So the changeup has been a little bit better. And it's mostly a, a four-seamer. I mean, it's pretty balanced now with uh, about 60% of the four-seamers still. Um, good value on it this year. So it's that's a step in the right direction for Heaney, but a step in the wrong direction uh, with losing all of the slider value. So he's, he's not throwing it as much, and he's moved it over to the change. And that's encouraging to get a little bit more balanced. But the changeup has historically been bad this season, as I mentioned, throwing it night, full 19% of the time now and actually getting a, a good bit of value out of it. So the four-seamer hasn't been nearly as bad. Um, he's a little bit more balanced with it. And the changeup allowing him to neutralize some of the power that he's been giving up to right-handers over the last season plus. And that's how he's going to be able to survive. Established with a, a good four-seamer, uh, good-ish. I mean, it's it's not yielding all that much value, but it's league average. Uh, it could be a hell of a lot worse. Um, but getting value out of an off-speed pitch will allow him to neutralize this 248 ISO that he's given up to righties uh, and a 33% hard contact rate. Still a lot of fly balls and some hard contact. He'll still get there on a barrel against righties. But susceptible, um, so still, at, at, you know, two homers per nine. So we can still get to him with a couple of righties, uh, but encouraging steps in, in the right direction uh, for him with the, with the changeup. But unfortunately, not, gonna, not going to be as good against lefties because the slider value is gone. So um, perhaps some early season noise a little bit. We expect the slider to kind of round back into form. Um and him to be a little bit more balanced. And if, if he can maintain positive change of value and get this slider to back to a break-even pitch, that can actually make him a hell of a lot more serviceable on a more regular basis. We know there's a lot of variance with him. And at 8,100, I'm not super thrilled about going after this. The ownership number is ticking down. It was it was pushing 28 and 30% in the early going this morning. It's it's coming down. I think this is more in line where it should be. I don't. I still don't want him in 20% of my teams, um, even though the median projection is getting pretty high here. Uh, the swing and miss stuff in aggregate, like I said, is down to about 25% this season, and that makes him just. I mean, yeah, it's a slightly above average spot against the Mariners who are striking out a 28% clip against lefties this year, buck 50 ISO average in every other metric outside of the creation, which is at 74 WRC plus. 
So it's an okay spot. I think we can certainly get some exposure to Heaney because the upside for strikeouts north of 25% is still there. And the Mariners are attackable with, with okay lefties. Uh, I think it's, it's fine. Uh, and it's encouraging that he's neutralizing some power to the right side here. But still a suspect four-seamer. And if the four-seamer is bad, this change value could drop off the, a cliff here. Uh, and you could see a real crooked number that the Mariners put up on Heaney here. So I don't want to get too crazy with my ownerships on Heaney. Um, but I think a little bit of exposure is fine. George Kirby, however, uh, 9,100. Also very high ownership. He's Unfortunately, you're just going to have kind of land on Kirby because who else do you really want to play in this range? I haven't really found all that many guys, and I think this is a playable price tag. I love this kid, and he's migrating a little bit of this four-seamer over to the sinker, but still both uh, very valuable pitches. And I'm I'm intrigued by, by what he's he's doing here a little bit. Now, the changeup's still not throwing a lot. Um... It's still not getting a hell of a lot of value out of this slider, but it's it's been a little bit better. He's going to throw strikes. He's going to throw it over the place. He's not going to walk people. So he doesn't give up a lot of power, and he's still got some swing and miss, despite the, a pretty disappointing outing against Oakland in his previous start. He still went seven innings. He just only struck out two and gave up three runs. So um, not great there, but 68% strike one rate is very encouraging. The only thing we're going to have to balance here, I think, is the 37% ownership and the fact that he gets Texas. Um, talked about this yesterday, even though uh, Logan Gilbert tore them apart a little bit. It's still a dangerous team to go after. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, buck 16 WRC plus with a 184 ISO and the hardest, uh, the highest hard contact rate against righties in the league. So with it as a team aggregate, I mean, this is a huge sample now that we got a thousand PAs. So, Still suspect a little bit because Kirby pitches to so much contact, 82%. Uh, it's not necessarily hard contact on the barrel, but it is contact. And, you know, contact's contact. So uh, could you get to some deep Texas tournament stacks? Yeah, I think that'd probably be all right. Um, it's not super thrilling. I, I would much rather just get to a decent bit of Kirby here. Uh, I like him in this range. The, the only other guy I really want to play is probably Giolito, maybe some Luzardo or something like that. Everybody else, I'm just like, eh. Um, so I think this is fine if you want to play some some Kirby and a little bit of Texas on the other side just because he's going to be popular. But these price tags are aggressive. 5,900 for Marcus Semien. Good fastball hitter, so you can attack a good fastball mix. Kind of a strength-on-strength strength matchup here. At 5,900, I'm not super enthused about that, to be honest. Uh, Nate Lowe, 47. Adelis Garcia, 58. So those three guys, you probably want to play in your stacks. Josh Young, up to 4,600 now. So no longer sub 4K. And unfortunately, that kind of takes them out of overly playable stack territory for me. Uh, and I'd much rather just side with Kirby here. Um, he's taking the right steps, throwing less of a, a bad pitch and, and more of the good stuff. And, and balancing out the arsenal here a little bit with uh, curveball. Slider still needs um, a little bit of a little bit of improvement, but uh, I mean it's about it's twice as good as it was last year. So, um, but still yielding about uh, an out to the field here. Usage wise, throwing the the slider a little bit less as well, down to about 15%. So throwing you know relying less on the bad pitch over here in the change and the slider, and a little bit more on the, on the good stuff in the, in the good fastball mix that allows him to get to a very plus curveball, giving him a, a good bit of value so far. So I think it's a, a fine spot to get to Kirby, um, but decent tournament leverage stack, uh, maybe a short stack for the Rangers over here. I think that's a, a playable as well. Uh, okay, so let's get to the last couple of games here. Try and get through these quickly. Uh, we're at about at an hour, I think. Jesus Lazardo, 8,800. Man, I love this kid. Um, uh, probably not so much in this particular spot. I, I don't really like going after Arizona. Um, I mean, they, they hit both righties and lefties very well. And even though Luzardo has high upside... Um, a little bit suspect here in the early going, at least in his last... 
what, four or five starts or something like that, the four-seamer usage is up to about 42 43% now, sinker down to about 10%. So he's migrating the sinker usage over to the four-seamer. And, oh, I lost him on my screen over here. Um, Change-up, still hovering about 19 20%, give or take. Slider, still at about 28%. Um, so, Arsenal mostly the same here. And value-wise, however, uh, the sinker has has really not been good. He is migrating it over to the four-seamer, which is which is good, but he's losing a hell of a lot of value on a pitch that he's still throwing a full 10% of the time. The changeup has been dreadful, as a matter of fact, so far, and that's what really kind of takes me off at a slightly fishy price tag. I think at 8,800 here, um, changeup really getting hit hard. And he's losing a few outs to the field. Um, so about three times as bad. So that's not really encouraging. Slider's still about, uh, still, what, marginal here. No real change in usage or value uh, in that respect. So he's still going to throw strikes here. And I still like the upside for him because he's still got whiff. Um, but not if this changeup is going to be like this is going to drop this strikeout rate to the right side of the plate significantly if he can't get any swing and miss on it. Uh, same thing with the two seamer. If he's, you know, he needs this to be at at worst a league average value, and at this point it really isn't. So they're both getting hit very hard, which is pigeonholing him into being a, a effectively a two pitch guy with two plus pitches here in a, a slider and a four-seamer, uh, which is kind of difficult to navigate, which is why we've really seen some sort of lackluster performances over his last few starts. One, two, four, five starts, I guess. Since it, that really good outing, seven innings struck out 10 against Minnesota, he really hasn't been all that impressive. Now, some of the K stuff at a K and inning is still there for Luzardo, and you can probably expect in most outings, even in difficult matchups, that he's going to be able to pick through a lineup pretty good. At 22% K rate, though, average WRC+, plus, pretty average in every metric but the hard contact, I'm a little bit worried that this changeup could get him into some um, some sticky spots here today uh, against Arizona. Not that I really want to play Arizona necessarily, um, but you could pick off a short stack of, uh, of a couple of righties. Christian Walker has been great. Lourdes Gurriel, Gurriel should be back in the lineup today. He was out yesterday, but just because he, uh, became a U.S. citizen. Um, so he's not hurt or anything, uh, but he's up to 4,800. Unfortunately, kind of makes him difficult to play there. Manny Rivera, 31. That's still playable. Can tell Marte 56, eh, not the greatest. So a little, um, a little fishy on a full stack here of Arizona, and I don't really want to go after Luzardo because he still had K stuff. Um, but a you know a one off here or there like a, a Christian Walker, even I mean he's even 4,900 today, so not the greatest here. Uh, if I had to choose just because of the pricing, I'd still side with Luzardo, but I'm not sure I want to get outsized exposures to him. Um, even at 8%, I think it's a fine tournament play. He has the upside still at this ownership figure to blast through Arizona, and I think I'd rather side with him in this instance, but not overly crazy about getting a hell of a lot of exposure there. Brandon Fott on the mound. This is his second start for the D-backs, high upside prospect, and this is the guy I alluded to earlier down in this cheap range. He's 4500 and I think he's just flat underpriced for the upside that he offers. He's got elite command. It's not going to show up here in the sheet because he gave up seven earned runs in his first start. Um, but he's got elite command. He's got a very high strikeout to walk ratio in the minors. He's got a 30% K rate there with about a 14% swinging strike rate in the upper minors. This is all a triple A. So this is their sort of prize gem. And even though they're, they're, they've got what three or, or four different guys, Dre Jameson, um, Tommy Henry, Ryan Nelson, that they've given looks to, here early in the season, Brandon Fott's the guy, and they're hoping that this guy in the future can anchor their rotation, at the very least be a very solid number two with a, you know, trailing a guy like uh, Zach Gallon or something. So, at 4,500, he's got four plus pitches. Um, 
and he can get whiffs with every single one of them. So Velo is there at 94. He's got okay delta on the change up. Uh, I'd like to see this drop down another two, three ticks or so. Probably give him a little bit more swing and miss. But uh, fine slider, Velo delta. Curveball's not excellent, but he's not going to throw it a whole hell of a lot. Um, but he, he's got an arsenal here to definitely pick through Miami. Miami is dreadful, and Zach Gallon took them apart again last night. So 25% K rate here, buck 22 ISO, 32% hard. It's a little notable, but uh, it's mostly on the ground. Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball, 78 WRC plus for the fish. So let's go after them once again with righties. We've been doing it all year. Um, now you got to be careful. Today you can be much more enthused about playing Jazzy. I mean, he's 5,500 still, but uh, this is a young arm, and uh, he's got upside against pretty much every righty in baseball. You can play him. And the only other lefty in the lineup is Luis Arise. 4,400, you could play him a little bit more readily today than perhaps yesterday. So uh, I, I really like getting Brandon Fott here. Uh, I think he's underpriced for the upside that he offers. Not sure if he's going to pop for like a 30, uh, like a Bryce Miller or something like that, but uh, it's in the tank. Like he, he has swing and miss stuff. He has the enough of an arsenal to make this happen. So if you need to get up to an expensive stack or an expensive um, arm on the mound like a Shohei, then he can make it happen. Okay, last game here. We're going a little bit long. Patrick Corbin, we can probably keep it short with him. 5,800. It's been encouraging. He's getting a lot more value out of the four-seamer this year than in the past. Um, I mean, it's still not a very good pitch. Sinker's still not a very good pitch, but it, it's hovering a bit closer to neutral league average value on the four-seamer, at least. Sinker, he's still getting hit pretty hard, so not a lot of not a lot to get too excited about in the fastball arsenal change for Patrick Corbin. However, the slider has re-emerged this season, and this is a plus pitch again for him so far. And that's really what's allowed him to survive through his first six starts or so. He's going deeper into games because he's eking a little bit more value out of, you know, still a bad fastball arsenal, but it's less bad than it was. And he's at least got a, a plus breaking pitch that has resurfaced uh, in the slider here. So still throwing a lot. Um, but encouraging that he's getting so much value out of it now, nearly one and a half outs above average uh, to the field now. So, I mean, this is very encouraging to see from the slider because this was the pitch that got him this huge contract over for the Nats. Um, Changeup usage still at about 8%. Sinker usage still at about 45%. So the the total usage hasn't really spread out all that much. He's migrated a little bit of the four-seamer over to the slider, as a matter of fact, and he's throwing this north of, of 35% now, pushing 38. So more of the good pitch, he's really feeling it, and that's really what we want to see, relying more on, on good pitches and, and less on the bad. So uh, encouraging at 5,800, could you land on him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably not in most scenarios, but I don't think it's horrific. Uh, I think he has six inning upside and a K and inning upside here. So, you know, I suppose maybe you could land on him at 5,800. You want to go out of your way to do it? I, I guess is a better way to say it. Probably not. But the Giants, they're going to they're gonna strike out a lot, man. And this, this team, when they go cold, they're going to go really cold. We saw with Jake Irvin, very low strikeout upside arm, did to them last night. 29.5% K rate against lefties so far this year. There's upside for Corbin here at 5,800 to survive with a good slider. Now, they're going to pop once again in, in ownership. Uh, they're coming in as the most popular team of the day. I'd almost like to get to uh, a little bit of Corbin as some leverage off of that. I think there's a some equity that we could squeeze out of this 1% ownership figure at the moment against the Giants. Uh, and get a lot of leverage on the field. I think this is an okay play at 5,800. I'm very encouraged by uh, plus value in the slider here and you know, less negative value uh, in the in the fastball mix because, as a matter of fact, the, the four-seamer um, is, is still, yeah, it, it's still bad uh, at, at about the same value. I was looking at it. A different number um, and the sinker is still bad so everything I said before is <laughs> is is right uh, wasn't just uh, kind of getting confused here but the the slider very encouraging in the usage and and the plus value so I think this is an attackable spot against Giants they're bad 
uh, and they strike out a crap load. So um, there's upside here at 5,800, I think. Logan Webb on the mound for them, 95. ay 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 um, I think we could r- really take a lot out of uh, basically these aggregate numbers. Nothing has changed in the arsenal here. Value is pretty much static across the board. So everything here in the aggregates is basically what Logan Webb is. And 9,500 is kind of an elevated price tag in what's kind of a suboptimal strikeout spot for a suboptimal or a a below average, I should say, uh, strikeout pitcher. 22% in aggregate, high ground ball rate, so it's a good suppression spot for him, kind of as it was last night, even though Disco gave up five runs and seven hits in the first inning. He still went seven innings because he didn't give up anything after that. He suppressed perfectly fine. And I think it's a kind of similar spot for Logan Webb here. Unlikely to strike out the whole country, um, which kind of takes me off of the 9,500 price tag and the 30% ownership. But I think it's a fine suppression spot. He could run seven innings here and keep this team um, on the bench pretty pretty reasonably, I think. Uh, still no power, still no production, despite the fact that they put up five runs last night in the first inning. They really should have been able to chase Disco. Uh, but he settled down very nicely and and was able to totally neutralize them afterward. Too many ground balls here, buck 60 ground ball to fly ball, and that's what's really going to make Logan Webb be able to go deep into a game like this. Um, Strikeout's unlikely to be there, but I think he's playable even in tournaments, probably not at this ownership, but even in tournaments because he'll be able to suppress um, so incredibly with a 2.3 aggregate ground ball to fly ball. So uh, really kind of off of offense, to be quite honest, uh, in this in this late game here. A little bit of Patrick Corbin, I think, uh, and I think that's playable. Uh, okay, so we are long here, uh, unfortunately. So let's quickly go over stacks and, and get out of here. Oakland and the Yankees. Probably going to get to the Yankees again. You can play some Oakland lefties here against Clark Schmidt. Big problems and a huge leverage spot, I think. Uh, Boston and Atlanta, offense only here for me. I don't want anything to do with these guys. I'm not encouraged by the Arsenal changes. Uh, Dodgers, Milwaukee, pretty much offense only here as well. Maybe some Cindergard pieces, but I don't know. He just doesn't have any K upside. Um, would most likely just get to offense here, like the Dodgers. San Diego and the Twins, interesting tournament game here as well. Maybe some Waka at 6,600, but mostly I'm just not all that enthused about um, pitching in this game, so I'd probably rather just get to offense, but kind of a man game overall. Interesting tournament spot. I think both of these offenses could pop, and you could maybe even see both of these pitchers pop as well, similar to the Brewers and Dodgers game yesterday. Um, White Sox KC, a little bit more intrigued with the White Sox today against Jordan Lyles, not intrigued with him at all. I do like Giolito a pretty good bit. think this is a, a fine spot to get him at uh, a depressed price tag. No Flaherty on the mound for me in Chicago for the uh, Cardinals, uh, but really no offense once again in this game. Um, would more readily get to offense than pitching, but not super intrigued, kind of just a write-off. Um, but, you know, if you want to keep attacking Flaherty, like, go ahead. You're not going to get any argument from me. Uh, Houston and the Angels, I don't really want uh, anything outside of Shohei on the mound here. Um, I, You know, I don't like going after Framber, and I don't like going after Shohei, but I, I want to play Shohei. 11-6, I think it's fine. Texas, Seattle, sneaky tournament stacks here um, just as a leverage kind of play. But Kirby, I like at 9,100. You can get to him. Heaney is making positive strides. You could play him as well. Uh, but he still gives up power, and he's still only a, a three-pitch guy. So um, you can play some Seattle also. Miami and Arizona, uh, I don't really want to play any Miami because they're terrible. I want to play a lot of Brandon Fott. Um, he's too cheap, I think. And Jesus Luzardo, I think you could play a little bit of him, but I'm worried about this change up here making him susceptible to Arizona. So you can get to a sneaky Arizona stack if you want. Washington and San Francisco, kind of off of offense, as I mentioned. Maybe a Patrick Corbin, but I'm not like super jacked about that. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Kind of a gross day, but uh, I think we get here in the early window here, probably get to a, a good bit of offense, Boston, Atlanta, Dodgers, Milwaukee in particular. So uh, hopefully that helps, guys, and that gives you some ideas to think about. Uh, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as always, and good luck here on a big Tuesday.